Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks for being here. Today, we're going to be talking about Nathan Brooks. A while back, I did another story with the same name, Nathan Brooks. Brooks and um, that other Nathan, I'll link it below, but he attempted to take his parents' life. And while doing the research for that one, I came across this Nathan who was 17 years old when he successfully killed his parents, Terry and Maryland. I asked you guys if you wanted to hear this one and I had an overwhelming response to talk about it. So here we are, let's talk about the other Nathan Brooks. But first, a word from our sponsor. Thanks to the sponsor today, Endel. Endel is a soundscape app that is backed with science-based patented technology. What is amazing is the technology factors and reacts to your heart rate, the time of day, as well as your location. As many of you know, I'm in Hawaii right now to distress from a very rough year. Endel is absolutely amazing, especially right now as I meditate and work on self-care. Endel can help you relax, focus, and sleep. And honestly, I could use help with all of them, and Endel does just that. The app is really easy to navigate. You can set a scenario that you're wanting to achieve. My most used are the self-care and the meditate, but they have deep sleep and reading to name a few available. And all you have to do is click and enjoy. The sounds are absolutely perfect, and right now, Endel is offering the first 100 viewers a free week of audio experiences. Just click the link in my description box and start enjoying Endel today. Thanks to Endel for sponsoring today's video. On September 30th, 1995, 17-year-old Nathan Brooks, who appeared to everyone who knew him a sweet, kind, and very intelligent young man, who did some really unspeakable things to his parents. I mean, we're going to speak about it, so what other adjective can we use? Uh, horrible, uh, unimaginable, disgusting, cruel? Okay, you get the point. So how did we get here? Well, let's start by talking about Nathan's life in the town that he lived in. Bel Air is actually a small village in Belmont County, Ohio, that according to the census.gov only had 4,100 residents. It's a beautiful village that is famous for its Imperial Glass Museum, located on the Ohio River, about 10 minutes from Wheeling, West Virginia. Now, Bel Air may be small. The one thing that they had was a lot of churches. They had 19, in fact. 19 churches. They had one grade school, they had one middle school, they had one high school, and they had three newspapers. But other than that, uh, 19 churches. But for young people, there are still a, a lot of things to do there. They have boating, skiing, and amazing summer camps. Okay, I have never done a case before where I could literally not find one picture of the victims, but we're still going to talk about them, but just know there isn't a lot of coverage of this case, and I couldn't find any pictures. If you guys have them, then please put links down in the description, but we're gonna talk about them still. Terry Brooks was a 53-year-old postal worker, and his wife, Marilyn, 52, was a pension clerk. They had three boys that had been born and raised in Bel Air. Jamie, the oldest, had attended college at Ohio State University. Nathan, who we're going to be talking about, is 17 years old at the time, a junior at Bel Air High School. And their youngest son, Ryan, who was 15 at the time, a freshman, and played football at that same high school. From the outside, people would think the Brooks were a happy all-American family. Mom 
mom and dad worked. All three boys did well in school. The house they lived in was pretty secluded, but the neighbors were close enough to see some bad behaviors. Because there was clearly more going on with this family, secrets that didn't come out until after it was too late. At Nathan's trial, his aunt Marlis his mom's sister testified that Terry Brooks was an alcoholic. She had moved away 10 years earlier, but her relationship with her sister had became strained long before she had left because Terry didn't like her. He was also controlling and was said to be abusive. She said that she was close with her sister Marilyn all of her life until a few years after she married Terry. Apparently, Terry kept his wife very isolated isolated from friends and family alike. When Terry drank, he was very abusive to his children. Marilyn doted on Nathan, while Terry favored their youngest son, Ryan. The aunt said that Terry started beating Nathan when he was around three years old. Anytime Nathan cried, Terry would feel the need to toughen him up. Besides the fact that beating your children is beyond heinous, this was a baby, a three-year-old. As we've seen so many times, this changed little Nathan. His aunt, a babysitter, and even the older brother, Jamie, said that when Nathan was young, he was very happy, friendly, outgoing. But the harder Terry was on him, the more withdrawn, depressed Nathan became. As a side note, it seems Jamie, the oldest brother, and Ryan, the youngest son, were both treated better by the father. The aunt herself was pushed around as well when Terry thought she wasn't keeping to his schedule. The aunt said that when she moved away, she remembered Jamie being a small, fearful child, but Marilyn didn't do much to stop this because she didn't want anyone to know about it, and she thought Terry could change. She said Nathan got the worst of it. He was a very sweet, gentle, happy little kid. Even teachers from his school said that they were aware that Terry was hard on his kids academically. They were expected to bring home perfect grades. All three boys had gone to Bel Air High School and attended the local Catholic church, where Monsieur George Yance knew them from. Nathan was very committed to the church, more than anybody in the family or, you know, his brothers. Father Yance later said that he was shocked to hear about the death caused by Nathan. He said to me, Nathan was always generous and gentlemanly, quiet and pleasant. Nathan had been an altar boy for the father and expressed his interest in becoming a priest. Jan said it was not very common for young people to tell him that they were interested in priesthood. He also said Nathan was a very intelligent, pleasant young man, but somewhat of a loner. If you guys can hear the birds, I'm really sorry. I can't quiet them down. Or maybe I'm not sorry. Maybe you're welcome. Anyways, Nathan was interested in all different kinds of religions. He studied the Bible, the Quran, any religious text he could find. He was an avid reader. He was described as a quiet and very pleasant boy by his neighbors and people in the small village he lived in. There was no indication he would do anything like what he did. Two of Nathan's good friends passed away the same year during his religious phase. One took his own life and the other passed from a brain tumor. When he attended their funerals, he said he realized that he wasn't like everyone else. Everyone around him seemed to be, you know, really sad. He said all he could think was, what would happen to their body parts? He said he wasn't sad. He didn't really feel anything. Even being there at his friend's funerals, it didn't really spark an emotion. He knew on a fundamental level, he was different. Right around this same time, Nathan had a babysitter who in introduced him into Satanism. And according to her, he was a very quick convert. 
Also during this time, he started listening to dark music, getting involved in the occult, and he started reading what some would consider darker text. He read Book of the Dead, The Satanic Rituals, and the Book of Jeffrey Dahmer and Jack the Ripper, and the Book of Whoever Fights Monster, a book um, about an FBI profiler. He also started doing drugs and committing petty crimes. He would take LSD and other hallucinogens and break into an abandoned house. It's the house that would start he would start doing satanic rituals. He would paint satanic symbols on the walls and try to commune with Satan. See, Nathan wasn't just limiting his religious beliefs to mainstream religion. He had decided to study all forms, including Wicca. The owner caught him on the property of the abandoned house and chased him off. He was later arrested for trespassing and vandalism, which was added to his arrest record of petty crimes. Up to this point, all of Nathan's crimes had been minor misdemeanors and no one had been hurt. He had friends at school that even thought he was quiet. Everyone agreed that he was a nice guy and no one saw what was coming. So what changed? The summer before his junior year and just before the murders, Nathan went to visit his brother Jamie at at Ohio State University in Columbus. He got a job at a local nursing home nearby. Nathan said he wanted to work with elderly people because he wanted to witness death up close and personal. He said he would seek out residents that were closer to dying and stick close to them, trying to be there for that moment. While Nathan was staying with his older brother uh, at Ohio State, uh, his name was Jamie, Jamie found some bones that Nathan had collected. He also suspected Nathan of harming neighborhood cats. Jamie's wife even found a lamb skull in the room Nathan was staying in. Did she freak out? Oh yes, you better believe she freaked out. Apparently Nathan had stolen a lamb from the agriculture department and sacrificed it, keeping the skull as a souvenir. When Jamie talked to Nathan about it, he said it was just a phase and Jamie believed him. A phase? What kind of phase? I'm sorry. That's the phase before becoming a serial killer. Stealing and sacrificing animals? It's a big red flag. I'm afraid to say we are going to have more than one red flag in this story. I apologize in advance. It's also during this time that Nathan meets two self-proclaimed witches who practice under the Wiccan faith. Now, to be clear, I am in no way saying that if you practice Wicca, you are a bad or evil person and that you will harm someone. I'm just giving you some background on Nathan Brooks. Nathan did say that meeting these girls was a definite turning point for him. They were really confident in their beliefs and they told him they could see into him and see that he was evil. Wow, great friends you have, Nathan, but they weren't wrong. They also listened while he told them all his inner dark thoughts. One day, Nathan, while still in Columbus, decided to stop fighting his urges and was going to kill someone. He saw a man walking down the street. Nathan had his knife out and was waiting for the man to walk by him, but a car passed by them, so he, you know, got spooked and didn't end up doing anything. A psychologist that spoke out about this situation who met with Nathan while he was in jail said he would have gotten a big boost off of knowing that he could have killed that guy and he held that man's life in his hands and chose not to. Friends from school and even his brother Ryan said that Nathan was completely different when he came home after spending the summer in Columbus. When school started again, he started writing troubling things in his books such as God is dead, Satan is good. Also signing his school papers, Nathan Brooks, 
master of death, which in my opinion, it is a clear cry for help. You don't write that and think no one's going to notice. You're writing that so you do get notice. But he did get noticed because of his troubles. He was referred to the school's guidance counselor, Amy Farmer. The counselor would say that Nathan was nice, but there was a time where in front of several students, he threatened to cut off her head and dump her body on the side of the road. Red flag number two. She also said that in a private session she had with Nathan, he told her that he smoked weed, used homemade LSD, and inhaled two cans of butane a day. He said that the butane helped free him from the obsessive thoughts. The counselor called Marilyn, Nathan's mom, but the mom told the counselor not to worry, that he was just going through a phase. This family in this phase excuse, no, there's real problems going on. That same psychologist, uh, John Mason, would later say that Nathan was a very intelligent person who very, was very aware of his potential of evil acts. A former babysitter, Carol Stasky, would say that she watched as Nathan went from a happy kid to a sullen and withdrawn kid due to Terry's abuse. The last week of September, Nathan was acting very strangely. He wouldn't answer friends at school when, uh, when they would say hi to him and pass him in the hallway. His friend Eric said that the warning signs were there, but no one was paying attention for up to a year before, and no one did anything. During that last week, Nathan showed up at the babysitter's front door and said he wanted to tell her that he loved her. She said he was very thin and fidgety, but when she asked what was wrong, he just told her not to worry and left. Red flag number three. The babysitter, Carol, also reported this to Maryland. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Oh, that's great news. His mom will now get him some help, right? I mean, how could she not? He did just threaten to cut the school counselor's head off. I'm sorry, you'd be wrong. Carol would say later that Marilyn basically blew her off. She just didn't seem concerned about it. This is the second time a person in position of trust has reported to Marilyn that they had concerns about Nathan. It's truly a shame, but she may really have thought he was going through a phase. I'm not sure. So on September 30th, 1995, Ryan, Nathan's younger brother, who is 15 at this point, made a faithful decision to spend the day and most of the night with his friend. Ryan and his friend, his name was Eric, had gone to a football game earlier and then back to the friend's house to play video games and just hang out. Marilyn had just, Marilyn the mom, had just returned that day from a business trip to Florida and was looking forward to just unwinding and relaxing. Terry was resting in bed when Nathan snuck up behind him and shot him three times in the head with a hunting rifle. He then went to Marilyn and hit her in the back of the head with an axe. Then he went back to his dad, decapitated him with a hacksaw. Then he went back to Marilyn and stabbed her ten times in the abdomen. He would later describe the murders in a taped confession, a confession that was already inconsistent with the time of death, but it was given that night. And he would say, I went into mom's room and I murdered her. It wasn't like my mom like the woman I loved. It was like skin, like an animal, like a dog. And then I murdered my dad and I took a walk. I cut off my dad's head and put it in a bowl in the room and had a mask on it with the holes in it to symbolize the gunshot holes in my dad's head. He said then he performed a dark mass. He said he was trying to decide something. He was trying to decide if he should kill more people or not. He said he decided not to. 
He tried to explain his relationship with Satan to the officers, and it's just like when you talk to the Lord, he would say. Sometimes they'll answer back. Around 1.30 a.m., Ryan called home wanting to talk to his dad, but instead Nathan answered the phone. Ryan told him to let the parents know that he's going to be spending the night over at his friend Eric's house. Nathan told him, you need to come home now. Their parents wanted him to come home. So when Ryan hung up the phone, a little bit of juvenile disregard, he decided to stay another hour and then he would go home. So now it's around 2.30 and the friend drove Ryan home. They thought that they passed Ryan's mom's car as they were driving, and they actually did pass the mom's car, and I'll explain that. So uh, the friend drops Ryan off. He waits a minute so Ryan could go in the house. Ryan entered the house quietly. He was late after all. He entered through the kitchen and immediately saw blood. Every room he entered, there was more blood. In the living room, on the chair, there was a bowl holding his father's decapitated head. The fact that young Ryan did not turn around and run immediately out of the house is a testament to his courage. If that had been me, no way, no sir, I am out of there. In the bedroom, he found his father's headless body with his arms above his shoulders almost in surrender. He then found his mother in her twin bed wrapped up in a bloody comforter with the handle of a long bladed knife stuck in her side. There were deep gashes in her head and face apparently made by the axe left at the foot of the bed. Also, with the axe, there were nails and a hammer because Nathan had originally planned on crucifying her. At this time, there was a pounding on the friend's door. So now we're back at the friend's house. Nathan showed up at the friend's house because Ryan was taking a long time to come home, and so they did pass each other. So now Nathan's over at the friend's house. The friend's mom thought maybe it was um, her son, Eric, you know, the, whose house it was. She thought maybe he had forgotten his key. So she goes over to the door and she opens it up for him. But it's Nathan, Ryan's brother. He was breathing heavily and looked really disheveled, slightly manic, and said that Ryan need to, needed to come home. She told him that, they had already left to take Ryan home, and then she closed the door on his face. When Ryan found all the blood and his parents dead, he started calling his friend's, friend Eric repeatedly. When the friend got home and listened to the messages, this was 1995, so it was probably the answer machine, he went back to Ryan's house. They thought he brought his dad with him. They thought it may be a joke, like Ryan was playing a joke, but it was no joke. So they called 911 and waited with Ryan. At first, the police were concerned something terrible had happened to Nathan also. It wasn't until after they searched Nathan's room, they changed his status from possible victim to possible suspect. While walking through the house, the police were in shock. They had never seen anything like what they were finding. In Nathan's room, he had what they would call satanic symbols drawn on the walls around his room. He had an altar set up. They also found a list, but we'll come back to that. We'll come back to the list. Right away, an alert went out for Nathan. They were afraid he had fled and it would take a long time to find him and he could potentially kill others. But instead, at 3.33 a.m., they found Nathan sitting in his mom's car parked at the local cemetery. His hands still caked with his parents' blood. He didn't resist when they came to arrest him. The sheriff said, Nathan told him he tried to talk to people. He is a very intelligent young man and very well read. There is a fine line between madness and genius. As the police began to investigate, the people in town were shocked. After all, this was a very small town and most of them knew the family. 
But the brothers Ryan and Jamie weren't at all shocked. Of course not. They didn't think Nathan would kill their parents, but they knew he was going through a hard time. But Ryan did say that he knew Nathan was abusing drugs and into the occult. Nathan had told his brother at one point, Satan is my best friend. Ryan had seen the occult satanic symbols painted on Nathan's bedroom walls. Oh yeah, those weren't new. Those had been there for a minute. The parents had seen them too. I'm going to call that red flag, what are we on, number four? Ryan also thought maybe Nathan was hurting neighborhood animals, but he could not prove it, so he didn't say anything. During this investigation, several things were leaked to the community. The fact that Nathan practiced in the occult, that he may have been a Satanist, he, how the bodies were found in the fact that there was a list of victims or potential victims. So even though the judge placed a gag order on the entire investigation, the town was in an uproar. People were talking. They were afraid that if there was a hit list, who was on it? Was Nathan part of a group that this group was going to pick up the killings now that he'd been arrested? Then there were bomb threats, actually. Um, they were called into, the, the, into football games, sporting events. This continued to happen each time the police searched and didn't find anything. But the town was terrified. Do you remember I told you that that house that was uh, Nathan used to go to that was abandoned, where he would go and do all his uh, substances at, and he would try to commune with Satan? Well, that house burned down. The fire department was called, but the whole structure had burned. Two times, the front and the back porch of the Brooks home was set on fire. Not the home itself, but the front porch and the back porch. The neighbors were interviewed, and they said they saw three hooded figures breaking into the Brooks house. But when the police chief was interviewed, he said that was false. But it was later leaked to the newspaper that a new altar had an altar had been set up in the Brooks home with a blue candle that had burned all the way down. The police chief also said there was no kill or hit list. No one knew what to believe. One thing was true, that the entire town was terrified. Nathan had already spoke to police with a social worker and Jamie and had given a confession. He also said that there was no one else who even knew of his beliefs. Only the two girls that were identified as witches from Columbus. He said anytime he tried to talk to anyone about it in Bel Air, they just laughed it off, thinking he was joking. So when they went to trial, his lawyer tried to get his confession thrown out, and that didn't work. And exposing the police chief, the list was admitted into evidence. And at the top of this list, it said, Satan will show you peace. So there was a list of 13 people. Some had words by their names, but the first was his brother, Ryan. Dismember and decapitate. Mother, eviscerate and crucify. Father, decapitate. And then the list went on. Amber, Lisa, Justin, Jason, Ryan, Dave, Corey, Jill, Mike, Ashley. No last names. Next to some names, it said molest some. Next to others, it says skin. After two of the female names, it said dismember, eviscerate. It was apparent that Nathan planned to carry out the killings both individually and in groups. Amber and Lisa were listed together, as was Jason, Ryan, and Dave. Two names had been crossed out, Ashley, and one of the crossed out names was grouped together with another name. Nathan did say when speaking to officers at the end was supposed to be taking his own life. There was one really big change that Belair saw that year that still stands. With everyone being so afraid and it being so close to Halloween, those parents could not imagine letting their kids run around going door to door trick or treating. 
So that year they canceled Halloween. The city council and the churches got together and created Boo at the Park, which in today's terms would be equivalent to like a trunk or treat. But they had it in the Bel Air Historic Park across from Bel Air High School, and about 600 of the Bel Air children came. They had police, they had the fire department guarding all vantage points. They still have it. It's usually earlier, around 6 to 7 p.m., so it's not dark yet. The first year, they actually encouraged the kids to dress in characters from the Bible and stay away from dark condemnations of witches and ghosts. During the trial, Jamie took the stand and did outline the alcoholism and brutality that their family experienced, Nathan especially. But at the end of the day, he still had killed his parents. The jury found him guilty of two counts of aggravated murder, and he was sentenced to life. Life with the possibility of parole after 43 years. Nathan Brooks on the inside has been a perfect inmate. He has had no infractions. He is eligible for parole in 2038. It's up in the air whether he will see freedom at that date. He will be 60 years old at that time. But I do know this, this story is full of instances where his mother was given the chance to help him, but wasn't able to or was dealing with her own life, but she didn't. I'm not saying that she owed her life for that, but I do wish she had gotten him help. I applaud the counselor and the babysitter who reached out to the mom trying to get help for him. That's what we want to see when we see a child needing help. We do what we can to get them help. And they did try. What a crazy case this is. I'm sorry I don't have more pictures and the clips than this one. This is a lesser known case. There's just nothing out there. It's so frustrating, and and this is in the 90s, so I know you guys will have some opinions. I cannot wait to read them in the comments. Sorry about my lighting today. It will be better next time. I just have to figure out a good filming area here, but I thought I would leave that open before the sun came up, but of course I record for so long the sun came up, and then I just noticed I was completely getting washed out, but anyways... Let's leave a stop sign in the comments because I wish Nathan had stopped before it got to the point it did. Thanks to all my channel members who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like to become a channel member or a patron, you can do so by clicking uh, the link in my description box. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Crimey Stories playlist if you would like to check it out. Stay safe, my loves. And remember, if you see something, say something. Bye.